Okay, this is uh, lecture one of uh, Gelzo's book, uh, Reconstruction, A Concise History. Um, we're going to uh, go through the introduction in chapter one, uh, and we'll also draw a little bit upon the film. Uh, so let's start by sharing the screen. Okay. I always think it's useful to know a little bit about uh, the authors um, in, in the works that you read. So uh, Gelzo is, uh, he got his uh, PhD at University of Pennsylvania, fine Ivy League school. Um, he is a renowned Lincoln scholar. Uh, he won the Lincoln Award three separate times. Uh, some of his works are Abraham Lincoln, Redeemer President, 1999, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, 2004, uh, so he's a very well-regarded uh, scholar of Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. Uh, so this book is uh, a very brief overview of Reconstruction with an idea of providing an introductory, um, at, uh, introductory summary of some of the thinking on uh, Reconstruction and also to promote an argument that Gelzo uh, has that this is a, uh, a special type of um, revolutionary response. Um, Gelzo is now at Princeton. Uh, he's a senior researcher and scholar in the Council of Humanities, very prestigious position. Uh, he formerly was the Henry Luce Chair uh, at Gettysburg College. Uh, Gettysburg, of course, uh, a prime university spot for uh, someone who works with the Civil War uh, and works with Lincoln. Uh, this book is out uh, 2018, so it's very new, right? So uh, this particular book is uh, really kind of a summary uh, of uh, arguments that uh, Gelzo is making in other places. So uh, in his introduction, he lays out sort of the intellectual foundation uh, he's going to argue here uh, about the opposing uh, worldviews of the presidency, the executive branch, and the legislative branch in the form of the Congress for uh, the uh, the conduct of the Civil War, and most importantly for our discussion, what it's going to mean for the after-war period, right? So let's start with the executive branch with Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln views, uh, uh, from the very beginning he viewed and continued to view throughout the war, that reconstruction or that secession is constitutionally impossible. There is no legitimate constitutional right for the states to leave the Union. So they are not leaving or renouncing their status in the Union. They are rebellious provinces, right? That need to be, um, the rebellion needs to be squashed. They're not uh, on constitutional grounds, uh, states that can leave the Union and form a new nation, right? For Lincoln, uh, this is a constitutional impossibility. Uh, so, um, his, his arguments through the war are uh, along this line, uh, and it also refers to what he thinks about it's going to be um, uh, focused on for Reconstruction. How do you re-knit or heal the uh, wounds of the Civil War? For Lincoln, uh, this is an executive branch issue because the states are in rebellion that need to be squashed through executive action, police and military action, as opposed to political action. Right, so this is an executive branch issue, not a legislative issue. Uh, and it's not a constitutional possibility that they can leave, so it's not something that would fall to the realm of the legislative branch. This is, uh, I suppose, uh, you know, a riot writ large, right? So riots are handled by the executive branch police department. They're not handled by uh, the United States Congress, right? In the Congress, you have a set of folks who feel, feel very strongly that uh, this is not a correct interpretation of events. Uh, we call them radical Republicans. We call them radical because their ideas um, about a number of things, uh, most important um, in, the, in the Congress, this idea of equality uh, makes them on the outer edge of um, political thought. So, for the radical Republicans in Congress, the legislative branch of this, of this nation, they say the Confederates have lost their statehood, 
right? By renouncing their uh, state's adherence to the union, they have forfeited their rights as a state. So readmitting these defeated territories means to readmit them uh, in, the, in a similar fashion to the same way that Congress admits new states from territories, right? So the territories the United States acquires, uh, they're unincorporated and there's a process, a step to be uh, petitioned for statehood and admittance into the union, uh, going back to colonial days. This has been a legislative branch issue. And so the radical Republicans in Congress say, this is precisely what we have to do with the Southern uh, territories, right? They have renounced their statehood, so they have to petition to get back in, in the same fashion that we termed Kansas and Missouri or Nebraska or California or Texas into states, right? Previously, they were territories, and then they became admitted into the union as states as they go through a process that is validated by the legislative branch. So we have during the war and in this immediate uh, concluding portion of the war as the war uh, is ending uh, uh, lincoln is assassinated before the war ends um, but this process is of at its root different ways of seeing what the rebellion is and different ways of seeing what reconstruction means and it also means that in their eyes the executive branch the president and the congress um, they have a different vision of who's going to take the lead, right? Uh, so this is sort of a conflict that's simmering along that it doesn't bubble up to the front because we're still engaged in defeating the Confederacy, right? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I would say, first off, uh, that Abraham Lincoln is, uh, that is something I've always uh, found um, amazing, uh, but it has increasingly become amazing to me is that Abraham Lincoln is an extraordinarily rare animal, uh, particularly as a politician, because Abraham Lincoln changed over time. He changed his ideas, his ways of seeing uh, the world, uh, his ways of seeing different people, uh, and he evolved in his thinking, right? This is unusual for politicians. Uh, particularly during partisan times, of course, during the Civil War, it's very partisan, um, because you get locked into a position and, and you know, you're defending your point. And so changing your uh, ideas, uh, especially during very partisan times, uh, is very difficult for politicians to do. It's really difficult for people to do as well, much to my dismay as someone who's an educator. But uh, Lincoln is a pragmatist, right? Um, his evolution in thinking um, it was something that, as he continually evolved, he wanted to bring others along his path. Uh, so we know what Lincoln does during the war, uh, and we know what uh, the initial vision he has for Reconstruction, but we don't know what he would do in Reconstruction um, in the afterwar period because he's assassinated and not president. So. What we know about Lincoln uh, during the war is that he's a pragmatist. His primary goal is to end uh, this rebellion, right? To restore the Union to health. Uh, and he's willing to do a lot uh, to get the Southerners to uh, stop this rebellion and rejoin the Union. Uh, he, right up until January 1st, 1863, when he uh, announced the Emancipation Proclamation, and I'll talk about the Emancipation Proclamation in just a second, right up until that moment, he would have allowed the Southerners to return to the Union with their slaves, right? Because he wanted to end the conflict uh, and restore the Union, right? But once he issues the Emancipation Proclamation, which is also a very pragmatic uh, statement, in one sense, but um, in another sense is a very radical document. But once he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, there's no going back, right? Now you have uh, an edict that there's only going to be one way of organizing American society. Uh, prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, as it was prior to the American Civil War, we had two nations, one relying upon uh, slavery and uh, the slave-based economic structure, and another one that's based upon free labor, right? 
after the Emancipation Proclamation, there will not be two. Somebody is going to win and uh, force the other side to accept uh, this, uh, uh, the ending of slavery if the Union wins or the removal of the Confederacy from the Union if the South wins, right? So um, this Emancipation Proclamation is a very pragmatic document. So if you look at the Emancipation Proclamation, um, you see that it's issued to um, the states in rebellion. The 11 Confederate states, uh, slavery is going to be eradicated, but not every slave-holding state was part of the Confederacy when uh, Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation. There are uh, states known as the border states that own slaves but have not left the Union. Abraham Lincoln does not want them to join the Confederacy. He does not want to add to his enemies. So he uh, issues the Emancipation Proclamation only to those uh, uh, states that are in rebellion and the regions that have not already been conquered by the Union, which were very uh, small at this time, parts of New Orleans and Louisiana, right? Uh, so this is a pragmatic document designed to um, signal uh, that slavery is going to end in the Confederacy. Now, that makes it pragmatic, but uh, Abraham Lincoln also understood that ending slavery in Georgia, the Carolinas, and Texas, and Florida means slavery is going to end in Maryland and Delaware uh, and um, in um, Missouri, right? The border states aren't, it's not going to be the slaveholding state of Maryland and the rest of the nation is going to be non-slaveholding, right? He understands that signaling the Emancipation Proclamation is going to end slavery in the entire union, but because he doesn't want to push those border states into his opposing camp, he uh, issues it in a way that at least leaves the idea that slavery is not going to end abruptly uh, for these other regions. He's also a pragmatist in that he wanted to re-knit uh, the nation and reincorporate the southern territories back into the Union as quickly as possible. So he uh, has very easy terms. This period of Reconstruction, by the way, uh, beginning with Abraham Lincoln and continuing up through his vice president, who becomes President Andrew Johnson, uh, up until a point, as we shall see, is the period known as presidential Reconstruction, because the president, the executive branch, is taking the lead in what uh, Reconstruction is, right? So for Abraham Lincoln, he wanted easy terms, and we see this idea in the film, uh, the Civil War film, where he says, if the rebels would lay down their arms, we will welcome them back as fellow citizens. This in effect says, if you stop shooting us, you can come back. And when you come back, you're going to have the same citizenship rights that you had before, the right uh, to uh, the right to the franchise, which means the right to the vote, right? Uh, the right to run and hold office, the right to serve on juries. You will have the same rights if you come back uh, by laying down your arms and swearing allegiance to the Union. It's also why he introduced what's known as the 10% rule, which says if 10% of the voters of a state um, prior to secession, right, the 10% of the voting public, so 10% of the white males, uh, swear allegiance uh, to the Union and renounce this separation, then the state can petition to come back in, right? Uh, he also appointed a Southerner, Andrew Johnson, to the ticket uh, in 18, for the 1864 re-election of Abraham Lincoln uh, to signal that he uh, wanted to uh, make the Southerners aware that he's uh, 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 interested in their point of view, that he's naming a Southerner uh, to be part of the ticket uh, for the easy terms of Reconstruction. He's not saying, you know, uh, everything is going to be uh, a wine and roses, but he is signaling that the hurdles you're going to have to get over to come back into the Union are going to be fairly low. This, these proposals of Abraham Lincoln are his vision of what Reconstruction will be. We don't know what it actually would be uh, when it happened because Abraham Lincoln is assassinated before he gets an opportunity to install his vision of Reconstruction and to respond to the Southerners as they are uh, 
um, being re-knitted into the nation. We don't know what would happen uh, because he's assassinated before um, he has an opportunity to begin this process and he didn't lay out a formal blueprint about what he's going to do. We just know that Abraham Lincoln was a pragmatist and that speeding the end of the war um, was his ma uh, one of his major goals. Uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation, getting rid of slavery is also, I mean, that's, that's the, there's no compromise on that after the Emancipation Proclamation. Slavery is ended as part of the Union, right? Even though it's not formally ended until we have the 13th Amendment, the Emancipation Proclamation signals um, what are the basic ground rules for talking about what the post-war period is going to be. Now, these are the plans of the executive branch, the chief executive, Abraham Lincoln, who's directing this or, or shaping out these ideas. The radicals in the Congress have very different ideas of what Reconstruction uh, is going to be and how it's going to occur, and their ideas are much harsher um, than uh, what these plans from Abraham Lincoln are. So, um, one of the things uh, about that I, I referenced briefly, and I probably should have talked about it a little bit more, so uh, I'll expand a little bit, um, is that business, uh, the business of history is a business of interpretation. Um, historians draw upon factual information, uh, but they craft an interpretation that seeks to explain how events unfolded and why events uh, unfolded. Uh, and how those events continue to unfold into the present day. Uh, historians grapple with these topics uh, and they develop a type of interpretation in which other historians maybe are persuaded or follow along and they form what we call in, in history a school of interpretation. Uh, this school of interpretation uh, is a way of addressing, uh, a framework for addressing historical events. Historians, uh, are tasked and lavishly compensated uh, to address uh, events in the past to understand them. We call the history of history writing historiography, right? So um, the historiography of Reconstruction uh, is a history unto itself. How did historians talk about it? What does it mean, right? This is useful to understand um, how things are understood in, um, in societies, right? So uh, uh, the first school of interpretation, the first way of, of grappling with this reality known as Reconstruction is known as the Dunning School. And this uh, is, uh, centers around uh, a Professor Dunning who was at Columbia, I believe. Um, and um, he uh, established a way of addressing and arguing and investigating and framing Reconstruction. And then uh, this idea was followed by uh, a number of his graduate students who continued to elaborate. And this idea became the way that uh, Reconstruction was taught. If this was a classroom 50 years ago or 60 years ago, right, we pick up the textbook uh, and we'd open the chapter 15 and it would say, Reconstruction, the tragic period. Right? Because this is how Dunning framed the interpretation of Reconstruction, and this is what it meant. And this way of viewing Reconstruction was something that everybody um, in the mainstream uh, world of education uh, followed and, and believed. Right? And the Dunning School refers to the tragic period of Reconstruction, and here's the particular aspect of the tragedy. For Dunning, the tragedy is people who are un or incapable of holding rule in the South are put in the position of power. And the rightful ruling class is evicted from power, prevented from holding power. And because incapable people were holding office, the reconstruction governments of the South were uh, terrible, corrupt, mismanaged, inept, uh, oppressive uh, government representing a scar on the nation's history. The root of Dunning's interpretation is that for Dunning and his colleagues, 
blacks are inferior. So it is insane for Dunning that these people would be put in positions of power and that these in clearly incapable people holding government in the South are uh, used and manipulated by corrupt Northerners to, uh, in effect, pick the carcass of the South uh, clean of all its value, right? That is a school of interpretation uh, that was not just the crank theories you may find in obscure places in the internet or on flyers tucked under your car, uh, windshield wiper, right? This is what the mainstream historians taught and understood and taught to students about what it is. Well, it's fundamentally a flawed idea because its basic premise is a racist idea, which is false, right? So the Dunning School was the way things were interpreted. There were a few challengers, W.E.B. Du Bois and James Allen in 1930, wrote histories of reconstruction that challenged this notion of this tragedy of uh, reconstruction, right? This major challenge to the historiography, the way of talking about reconstruction uh, written and taught about by the professional historians, um, promote a uh, counter challenge, a revisionist interpretation, uh, was uh, the civil, was fueled by the civil rights movement, who addressed the basic fact that the Dunning School interpretation relied upon a racist interpretation of people. Right? And so discarded this, uh, the fundamental ideas that Dunning promoted and said instead of, um, if you want to call the Reconstruction period a tragedy, it's a tragedy, not because uh, of the people who were in political or who achieved political power, but because their uh, egalitarian forward thinking vision of what the nation uh, could be was overturned by white supremacists and racists who overthrew uh, these governments uh, through the ballot box and installed uh, uh, white majority governments from the ruling order from before the Civil War, right? So these white supremacists undid what was a promising uh, a series of uh, events uh, under Reconstruction government. So the revisionist replace, discard the, the racist interpretation of the Dunning School. And so uh, this sort of interpretation held sway. In the Dunning School, um, Reconstruction is a tragedy uh, and the stories are of uh, corruption and ineptitude and bad things. Uh, in the civil rights, uh, everything is going swimmingly until these uh, racist uh, white supremacists uh, from the former Confederacy uh, regain political power and undo everything. So you have two competing visions, right? Um, there's a problem with both. The Dunning School interpretation, the obvious problem is that it's racist, right? And it's based upon a falsehood. Uh, the problem with the revisionist, perhaps with good intent, uh, de-emphasize bad things that happen under Reconstruction government, like corruption and ineptitude uh, and et cetera, and emphasize the good things that were occurring, uh, and so create a distorted uh, historical picture, right? In seeking to reject this previous interpretation, they're giving a um, one that's not a, a, a fair accounting of events. And so then you have the post-revisionists. These are a group of historians who come in. The most prominent post-revisionist is a man by the name of Eric Foner, who wrote a book about uh, Reconstruction uh, that is a landmark work uh, on the topic of Reconstruction. And Foner is a post-revisionist. He says, you know what? The Dunning School, of course, it's fundamentally racist and wrong, right? The core ideas. But many of the historical events that they recounted that showed that Reconstruction was not going uh, uh, in ways that it should and was corrupt, they're, they're real events. They're real accounts. And they should not be swept under the rug. They're part of the historical record. The civil rights fuel revisionists um, their accounts are fundamentally more correct based upon the idea that um, people, um, anybody can rise to political power through uh, given the opportunity and, and perform well, right? So uh, that interpretation, but they overemphasize the, the good things about Reconstruction and, and underemphasize the bad things. So as a post-revisionist, 
uh, Foner seeks to graph the two together in a new interpretation. Um, Foner uh, crafts this framework. It's very uh, uh, influential in the field. The book came out in 1988. Uh, Gelzo is a post-revisionist as well. He's rejecting this Dunning School interpretation that's fundamentally racist because it is, and he's also critiquing the civil rights ideas, correct? But he's also uh, attacking the way Foner addressed it. Foner is a neo-Marxist who views the reconstruction through the lens of economics and politics and sees this as a class-based revolution in a true Marxian sense. Uh, Gelzo uh, says this is, this is a revolutionary period, right? There is a thing going on, but it's not a Marxist class revolution. It's a middle-class capitalist revolution against the aristocratic landowners who held the power before. Right? So he calls it a bourgeoisie democratic revolution. I don't want you to get hung up in the particular political terms of, um, of those notions, but it's an idea that rather than being a radical class-based Marxist revolution, as Foner argues, uh, the framework for understanding this is a much more conservative middle-class capitalist uh, revolution versus um, you know, pseudo-aristocratic uh, wealthy landowners of the South. Uh, so it's just a different framework. They're both post-revisionists. They're both seeking to evaluate uh, these uh, things uh, through political and economic terms, largely. All right, so we don't know what Abraham Lincoln would have done as the Reconstruction uh, president, but we do know tragically what his vice president, Andrew Johnson, does. And so in order to talk about Andrew Johnson uh, uh, during this period of presidential Reconstruction, when he is the president and directing Reconstruction, useful to know a little bit about Andrew Johnson. Uh, his personal biography, um, he is uh, a, a very interesting fellow in all sorts of ways. He in, in, He's the vice president for the Republican Party. He's Abraham Lincoln's uh, vice presidential uh, running mate, uh, but he actually started as a Democrat from the state of Tennessee. Uh, he was born uh, poor uh, and through uh, he was born into a class that is known as a yeoman farmer, which is the small landowner, a small farmer. Uh, he was born um, not to the wealthy class, right? And not the ruling class in this uh, uh, pre-Civil War South. Uh, he was born uh, to a poorer class and worked himself uh, in the fields. He was a slave owner, and uh, Gelzo talks about that, but I think we need a little bit be a little bit more fair uh, to Andrew Johnson. He was a slave owner who was a, a small uh, f a farmer and slave owner in which he worked side by side with his slaves in the field. He was not a plantation owner sitting on the front porch drinking bourbon and branch water and watching uh, the slaves work in his large cotton plantation. He was a small farmer who worked side by side with them. And at some point, Andrew Johnson began to recognize that slavery was an incorrect way of organizing the world. He was, became opposed to slavery, even though he himself had owned slaves. And so at great economic cost to himself, he freed his slaves. He didn't sell them to somebody else and recapture his investment. He came to recognize that slavery was inherently uh, a wrong idea. And so he freed his slaves at great economic cost. He continued to work um, and uh, began to involve himself in, in politics and started at the low level of politics and worked his way up. Uh, when Tennessee voted to leave the Union, uh, 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 join the Confederacy, uh, Andrew Johnson was a strong Unionist, supporter of the Union. He refused to go, right? He renounced uh, the efforts of Tennessee to leave the Union. So, um, he worked his way through the political world by the American Civil War. He was in the U.S. Senate. He refused to resign his seat uh, when Tennessee left the Union, so he was kind of a senator without a home. Uh, but uh, Lincoln made him military governor of Tennessee, uh, and as we see in 1864, he added him to the ticket uh, as his vice presidential candidate. Uh, and uh, prior to uh, Lincoln's assassination, there were every indication for those uh, who favored a, a harsher uh, set of responses to the South that Andrew Johnson was on board with it, right? So uh, uh, Gelzo quotes uh, Andrew Johnson saying, he promises to be the slave's Moses, right? To lead them out of bondage. 
Uh, and there's no doubt that Andrew Johnson hated what, uh, what we call the slaveocracy, the um, wealthy pseudo-aristocratic slave owners of the American South who owned the large plantations, uh, had uh, uh, hundreds of slaves working for them, uh, who had outsized uh, uh, power in cultural, social norms, uh, in economic terms, and absolutely ran politics, right? This political system of the pre-Civil War South was dictated and run by large plantation owners who believed themselves to be, uh, or styled themselves to be the uh, descendants of the Knights of the Round Table, an aristocratic class who are placed in this position of rule, uh, and beneath them, they have all these various folks. This slaveocracy, they look down on people like the yeoman farmer of Andrew Johnson, and Andrew Johnson hated them, right? Uh, but as it turns out, as much as he hated the slaveocracy, uh, it turns out that he wasn't, uh, he was even less fond of the black population of, uh, of the nation that while he did not believe that uh, these descendants of African slaves should remain in slaveholder status, he, not, he did not envision that blacks and whites could be equal in any real sense. He didn't think that blacks should be enslaved, but he didn't think they should have the vote either, as we shall see. So Andrew Johnson, uh, those who were uh, radicals who were hoping for uh, a more um, assertive uh, reorganization of the South under Reconstruction had initial high hopes for Andrew Johnson because Andrew Johnson talked about how treason should be met with punishment, that traitors must be punished, that there must be some uh, accounting uh, for the destruction caused by these uh, rebellious regions of the South. So uh, there, there were many who had high hopes that Andrew Johnson would align with uh, these radical elements in the Congress. Um, but that didn't turn out to be the case. And the first place we see this, so a Abraham Lincoln is assassinated in mid-April. Uh, Andrew Johnson's elevated to the presidency. At the end of May, we get the first clear inkling of what Andrew Johnson's vision is for Reconstruction, and it comes in the form of something known as the May Proclamation. Now, Andrew Johnson claims that he's simply continuing Abraham Lincoln's easy terms for Reconstruction in these uh, May Proclamations, right? Uh, but when you look a little bit more closely, there are aspects of the main proclamations that are just about what is inter of interest to Andrew Johnson. So uh, in um, this uh, destruction of the South uh, and the chaos of the South, the Union Army uh, acquired an awful lot of property. Uh, and uh, as uh, William Tecumseh Sherman had been doing and some other Union generals had been doing on their own, uh, they began to distribute this confiscated land to uh, the freedmen population, the former slaves, right? So uh, the famous phrase of 40 acres and a mule is an outgrowth probably of something that uh, um, William Tecumseh Sherman had been suggesting, right? That he's going to carve up this land for the people uh, who had labored on it without compensation for generations. Um, so there was this land that was being distributed. Uh, with the May proclamations, Andrew Johnson says, stop. Stop uh, distributing this land. Uh, we're going to restore it to what he calls the legal owners. And how do you know that they're legal owners? Well, they have their deed to the land on file at the courthouse. Well, clearly a lot of uh, land distributed or distributed by uh, union generals to former slaves, it's not going to have a title or a deed to the land. Right, so what in effect he's doing is giving the land back to the former property owners who were the rebellious Confederates, right? He uh, orders the restoration of rights to former rebels, including the vote. And that does not include black votes, right? He doesn't say blacks can't vote. He doesn't state it as boldly as that, but in the May proclamations, he says, there's a lot of chaos uh, in the South and the voting records are in disarray. So, to determine who can vote, I think anybody who could vote in the 1860 election should be able to vote going forward, right? So restoring the rights to these former rebels includes the vote. In 1860, there were no uh, slaves who could vote, and um, there was very few, if any, uh, free people of color who could vote. 
1860. So in effect, he's giving the vote back uh, to the Confederates, right? Saying the white Southerners uh, saying, okay, now you get the vote back. Um, he also um, puts a, a spin on this by creating what's called the $20,000 rule. The $20,000 rule says that anybody who owned $20,000 worth of property uh, prior to the American Civil War, right? Which uh, in 2007 money, the last time I put it through the calculator, uh, was about $368,000 worth of property. So you're talking about a very small percentage uh, of the, the Southern population. These folks are disenfranchised. They lose the right to vote. They can't run for office. They can't serve on juries. They've lost their citizenship rights with the fallen caveat. They can petition to get their rights back, but they have to petition the president directly, right? So this is where you see Andrew Johnson's hatred of the slaveocracy coming to the fore. The slaveocracy are the people who are gonna be disenfranchised, right? They want their citizenship rights back, but in order to get that, they have to come to Andy Johnson, hat in hand, and ask him directly for the restoration of the political rights. This is not something Abraham Lincoln was promoting. This is an idea that is Andrew Johnson. And it's, he, he must have gotten an enormous amount of satisfaction that all these people who looked down on him because he was from the yeoman class, he was not one of the ruling class in the South, even though he rose to political position, right? He was never of the right sorts. Now they have to come uh, and ask him, please, can I come back, right? Uh, so these are sort of the background of Andrew Johnson. And then we see how it plays out uh, in the political realm. Andrew Johnson uh, says, okay, we're going to readmit these states. And he says they don't have to go through this process uh, of reincorporating or incorporating territory in the states that is a legislative process. These are things that are going to go through the executive branch. So he is going to restore the southern states uh, in a process that gives no role to Congress, right? This is going to be an executive branch issue. And me, Andrew Johnson, uh, I'm the uh, chief executive, right? And in this vision that he is beginning to sketch out and is beginning to promote, you see uh, a, a, a world in which there are no rights for former slaves, because that's how Andrew Johnson saw things, right? So uh, here in the South, you have uh, the entire structure of politics has been wiped away, right? The Confederacy uh, seceded from the Union. They had their own government, but now they're defeated. So all those government positions are wiped away. So Andrew Johnson, he has a vision for how things are going to go, right? Um, he believes, Andrew Johnson, that all across the South, there are a lot of people just like him small yeoman farmer uh, who are pro-union men, right, who during this secession uh, were, had been shut out of politics and were prevented by this pseudo-aristocratic uh, group known as the slaveocracy. By uh, opening up the political world in the South, Andrew Johnson believes, he's going to get people who think like he, he does, right, that are pro-union men, small farmers, these are people who have been blocked for politics before, and now they're gonna be put uh, into position of powers through the ballot box. Because in order to create these governments, the uh, restoration of state governments, uh, including governors, lieutenant governors, uh, legislatures, dog catchers, mayors, everything that needs to be recreated, he's going to have an election because you know this is America. So the, there's a special election in 1865, which, in each uh, state, there's an acting governor appointed by uh, the executive branch, Andrew Johnson, who is going to organize a convention to have elections to fill all these slots, right? But it's not just state governments. These special conventions are also going to elect uh, U.S. congressmen and U.S. senators who are going to Washington, D.C. to, to uh, uh, represent the state's in the United States Congress. That's what Andrew Johnson's plan is. And in his mind, he envisions a lot of people just like himself, right? But that's not what happens. There is uh, some switch in power 
uh, to these type of folks in what's known as the Upper South, right? The regions uh, near the uh, north along the border states, there are um, new folks who are installed in power. But in what's known as the Deep South, uh, Texas, the Carolinas, Florida, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, these places, the exact same political ruling class, in some cases, the exact same people are put back into power. Uh, and so as soon as they get back into power, these former rebels go about trying to create what they want. What do they want? They want slavery. Because for them, slavery worked awfully damn good. But because now the, uh, the 13th Amendment uh, is uh, close to being passed, it's not actually passed until December uh, of 1865, the final ratification, but it's on the way uh, to being passed, which is eliminating slavery. And of course, the Emancipation Proclamation has eliminated slavery in all the defeated territories, right? So soon, the Constitutional Amendment, the 13th Amendment, is going to uh, be complete and slavery will be eradicated. So these former rebels can't have slavery uh, directly, so they come up with a, their own formulation. It's known as uh, black codes, and these are state and local laws that are passed to reestablish control uh, over the black population. They restore slavery in all but name, right? Uh, and so what are some of these uh, uh, black codes? So uh, there's something known as a vagrancy law which says uh, everybody in the South um, uh, needs to sign a labor contract uh, to ensure that they have some sort of income. Uh, or they have to have a, a, a amount of money on hand uh, that um, they can uh, demonstrate justifies that they will not become a public charge, right? So what in effect that means is the police would stop a black person on the street and say, uh, show me your contract. Uh, that you are working or will be working soon, or show me you have $5. And if they couldn't uh, present $5, which was a significant amount of money uh, in this destroyed South after the war, then uh, they are arrested. And when they're arrested, um, they uh, can have their fine paid by anybody, and then that person would have to work to pay off the debt to whoever paid their fine, right? This is, you're, in, you're arresting somebody and then uh, uh, lending them out to somebody who pays their fine and then uh, works them until they pay off what they owe them, right? It's slavery, you're controlling labor. They pass uh, things known as vagrancy laws, right? That's a vagrancy law. They also pass things uh, such as the apprentice law. And this is the one that, uh, of all the black codes that, probably embittered um, the freedmen population the most, right? Apprentice laws say the following, that uh, if you are, your family's in uh, not good economic health and you have children, then the state will take your children and apprentice them uh, in a, a task that will provide them with an opportunity for a career. So they take children uh, from their poor parents who the state says, you're so poor, you're not gonna be able to raise them properly. We're going to take your children and teach them a skill. Well, guess what the skill is? Picking cotton on some land, a large landowner's property, right? So the state legally, under these black codes, state local laws, are seizing children for breaking the law, of not having enough money to uh, show that you can raise your child uh, properly, and are taking them and, and uh, farming them out uh, to do uh, plantation labor, right? So these are things that the uh, rebel governments installed into power um, start go uh, about doing, controlling their labor uh, in the way they did prior to the Civil War. Uh, now using uh, legal terminology, you're a vagrant or apprentice or you've broken the law or some such thing, right? Uh, but the practical intent is still the same. They're getting uh, slave labor uh, to produce their products, right? This is not what Andrew Johnson wanted. He didn't uh, uh, intend to set up a, a slavery system or pseudo-slavery system in the South in this immediate period, uh, and, he, um, and he was not happy that it turned out this way, right? Uh, but Andrew Johnson was willing to accept it 
because he believed the nation wanted to get Reconstruction moving along. And because fundamentally, uh, Andrew Johnson didn't believe that blacks and whites could be equal, right? Uh, his intent was, you know, and this is something we can fix going forward, uh, but, you know, we can't hold things up because we got to get this nation re-knit, right? Um, the radical Republicans in Congress do not see things the same way as Andrew Johnson. They look at these events that are unfolding with horror uh, and anger, right? And so they say, you're putting the same people back into power. You are letting the rebels recapture uh, in, the, in this reconstruction period what they have lost in the field, right? And they say, we're not having it, right? So it's setting up a conflict between the executive and legislative branches. Okay, so next time, um, next lecture, I will talk about uh, the response in the United States Congress. Uh, which takes a particular form, but fundamentally you have here two different visions. One, the executive branch uh, vision, which is uh, uh, Andrew Johnson says he's continuing Abraham Lincoln's easy terms, and then you have the Congress that says uh, actually that's not how things are going to work. All right, uh, so keep up with your reading, and I will see you next time.